Okay. And share. Okay. And that way we can share with anybody who was not able to be here. But I find us with most Zoom meetings, people show up kind of like we've got folks here that want to make sure they're squared away and show up and get in. And then we have a lot of people that like 559 and 58 seconds. Yes. So yes. Click on that link. That's yes. That's been my experience too. Yes. So Paige, are you still in Central Florida or did you retire to another part of the world? I went to North Alabama, which is the Presbyterian that ordained me. Okay. Um, and was interim exec there. Okay. So I've been a part of the Senate of Living Waters yeah. for a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but then by the time I finished that call, my younger son was teaching airplane mechanics here in Orlando. Mm -hmm. and I had not sold my house. So I came back here and have worked diligently to stay out of um, the current exec's way, but but we are friends and have a good working relationship. And so I've he's asked me to do some things here. Good. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So where are you in East Tennessee, Laura? I'm in Chattanooga. Okay. So holding up the southern end of the yes presbytery here the southeastern end of the presbytery yes the very southeastern end and i'm curious to see we we have more of our churches are in the knoxville area than any other part as far as concentration so typically we we skew a higher percentage of folks at any kind of presbytery related meetings zoom or otherwise from the knoxville area because there are more. That makes sense. Yeah. And so we're grateful for Zoom that lets us pull in experts like you from your living room in Orlando to talk with us. Yeah, it just, that's one of the things I think the pandemic taught us that we can do things cheaply and well mm -hmm. using technology. Absolutely. The doing them well is something where the learning curve was a steeper part to make sure we <laughs> microphones and video cameras and other things like that to work. Yeah. I was fortunate. My husband is an audiovisual technician um, by profession and was furloughed, unfortunately, during a good uh -huh. bit of the pandemic because nobody was going to conventions or conferences anymore. Right. Um, but he became our online worship guy. And so we had the ability to do a lot of things that other churches had. It took longer to kind of cultivate those resources. So we were fortunate to be able to have him there to do that. We, I was, I was doing an interim here in a church um, during the pandemic. And we had, as soon as we could get back together, we had a tech guy there who knew what we would need and told me what to buy. And yeah. Yeah. we were able to, um, to do hybrid that's great oh gosh it was we did hybrid session meetings mm -hmm. that's wonderful uh, yeah yeah welcome all who are creeping in here as our squares multiply i love watching this happen with zoom meetings i do too James, are you joining us still from another part of the country? Yes, I am at the uh, training for General Presbyters here in Baltimore that's going on right now with the MCLO. Wonderful. I remember doing that. <laughs> <laughs> there are people here who remember you quite well also. I was talking <laughs> I was talking to Darius this morning and told him we had a, a seminar with you this evening. And so he said to tell you hello. Thank you. He's a good guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most of my most of my friends and colleagues among the EPs are either retired or about to retire. Our Executive stated clerk here retires in September. 
So we're in um, in that transition time. Jim, you just went sideways. Uh, okay. Yeah, give me a moment. Okay. <laughs> I love that's these. Not an, yeah, that that's, not an, that's not an uncommon. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's about Zoom. Yes, yes. Well, I've, I've not done it on Zoom, but it's not it's not uncommon for me either. <laughs> Sometimes we all go a little sideways. Mm. Liz, I like your cat. That's my 15 year old. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Well, she's she'll be 15 in July. And she's she probably... is my avatar. Nice. Well, she she She's the closest in temperament of my three cats to me, so she's my <laughs> avatar. Plus, she's my baby. I've I have almost like God. I have known her since she was in the womb, and uh, yeah, <laughs> she thinks you are God. Uh, she really, she really does. Uh, she they they all get mad at me if I if it's rainy. I it's my fault because the weather's <laughs> yeah. bad, and you know all this bit about cats thinking you're God. I mean that they are God. No. Yeah. I am. Yeah, I may. We may be joined by my cat. Um, we are going uh -oh. to have rain. We're going to have rain while we're on. And when that happens, it is my fault. And she comes and lets me know that I really need to fix this. It's noisy and she doesn't like it. I, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> How wonderful. You never knew you had such power. And I don't, but she thinks well, she's God. And so, yeah. like, like God with Moses says, okay, you go do this. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 15 now. Yes. Great. Welcome others who are coming in. We'll start in a few minutes, but we are grateful that y'all were able to be here tonight. Thank you for having this meeting. Oh yeah, we're grateful. And many thanks to Emily Anderson who helped connect me with Paige and, and knew that she would have some great wisdom and insight to offer to our discernment in this process. And probably read all of the book of order more than a lot of us in these squares um, over the years. Yeah, Emily and I have known each other since she was, since we were both members of Tampa Bay Presbytery when she was associate at Pomacea and I was at First St. Pete. Oh, and so, wow. and so when this, she knew I was chairing the task force. And when this came up, she texted me sometime the end of last year and said, okay, when it's coming up in middle Tennessee, I, I want you to help us understand. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. When I first met Emily, she was at that church in Tampa. That was we met at Montreat many years ago. She's our minister. I'm from New Providence. Oh, great. Well, tell her hey for me. She's just started her sabbatical. She has a three-month sabbatical. And this past Sunday was her first Sunday off. So we're happy for her. She's yes. very deserving of one. Yes. All right, well, I will go ahead and get us started since it's uh, just a little, a minute after six and others may trickle in and join us, but that will, that will be all right. So first let's start with a prayer. Holy one, we give you thanks for this day and for um, this technology that can connect us from across the presbytery and from across the states of our connected church as we seek to discern your will, as we lead together as presbyters and commissioners for this upcoming presbytery meeting. So we pray for your spirit to open our minds, our hearts, to um, grant us your wisdom and the work that we do. Um, we are grateful for the gifts and experience that Paige brings to our conversation this day, um, that we might be faithful to you and the ways in which you are leading our church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, welcome, friends. I'm glad to introduce you to um, Paige McWright, who will mostly be leading this. And in a moment, she'll be sharing her screen and kind of leading us through all of this. 
Um, but she is a prior ex executive presbyter of Central Florida Presbytery, and but has now retired and is in Central Florida and has done a lot of work in the areas of the Book of Order, both in the um, the new form of government, the F and G sections, as that revision was done a few years ago, and then worked on the task force for the revision of the rules of discipline that is part of the amendments that we will be um, discerning and voting on next week at our presbytery meeting. So um, thank you all for taking the time to be here tonight. We are recording this so that we can share it later for those that missed it and would like to have a little bit of insight and education about this big part of our book of order. So um, Paige, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. I didn't ask Laura to share with you all, but I will tell you myself, I have twice been a member of North Alabama Presbytery, which means I briefly was a member of the Synod of Living Waters and have great respect for the Synod and for what you all do. After I retired here, they in North Alabama asked me to come and be the interim exec there, which was such a privilege. And because that's the Presbytery in which I was ordained a long time ago. So I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. Talking about church discipline. And I guess the first thing I want to say is if you look at the current book of order, you'll see that it's called the Rules of Discipline. The task force that worked on the revision decided that we really, that, that, that it doesn't need to say rules in the title. That it is in fact, the church's way of holding uh, both individuals and councils accountable. And it's much, um, it's much fairer to call it church discipline because that's what it is. Both the current rules of discipline and the revision say that the power that Jesus Christ has vested in his church, a power manifested in the exercise of church discipline is one for building up the body of Christ, not for destroying it, for redeeming, not for punishing. It should be exercised as a dispensation of mercy and not of wrath so that the great ends of the church may be achieved that all children of God may be presented faultless in the day of Christ. Church discipline is the church's exercise of authority given by Christ, both to guide, control, and nurture its members, and for the constructive criticism of offenders. Our church discipline is based on the constitution of the Presbyterian Church, and it is for the internal discipline of the church. That's why it exists. It doesn't replace secular jurisdiction. It's not based on the same rules as secular jurisdiction. And one of the things that's before us in the amendments is should we continue trying people after they leave the denomination while, um, while in the midst of an allegation of misconduct? And the answer to that really is we can't because it's for the internal discipline of the church. There are things that we can do to minister to the people who have been left shocked by the leaving of somebody, either from their members, membership or their pastors leaving, but we can't discipline people who aren't a part of the church. We have two processes, remedial processes for the accountability of councils, disciplinary process, for the accountability of individual members of congregations and presbyteries. The intent of the revision is not to redefine our discipline, but to make it easier for the church to understand and use. Everybody clear about why we have it? Mm -hmm. Good, okay. I'm gonna leave time for questions at the end, by the way, but um, I just wanted to check on that. So Chicago Presbytery, how we got here is Chicago Presbytery in mm -hmm. 2016 sent an overture to the General Assembly requesting that the rules of discipline be revised to make them more accessible to the whole church, to preserve and enhance the accountability of councils and individuals to the church, 
to expand the role of mediation and alternate dispute resolution, to provide flexibility in crafting censures and remedies, particularly in light of what we've come to know in ethical and social development and from experiments by the secular legal system with alternative sentencing. So that was our charge. And, and in 2017, the moderators of the General Assembly, the Assembly said, yeah, we ought to do that. So in 2017, the moderators appointed a task force made up of the people you see on your screen, Barbara Bundick, who's now retired, but was stated clerk in Chicago Presbytery, Greg Goodwiller, whom I expect you all know um, because he is the executive of the Senate of Living Waters, Teresa Howell, who is stated clerk now in North Alabama and um, Northwest Georgia Presbyteries. She was in Middle Tennessee, but has retired from that. Dasker Ross, who is retired executive and stated clerk of the Senate of Southern California and Hawaii, and for many years worked for the General Assembly. Dasker did a side-by-side, -side, which is available somewhere on the General Assembly website, though I can't find it, that gives you a detailed comparison of, of what's in church discipline and what's in the rules of discipline. Donna Wells, who's retired as stated clerk of the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta, and me. Um, Dan Saperstein was our liaison to the Advisory Committee on the Constitution. And Laurie Griffith and Flora Velas Diaz were our staff people. So we were, we were to report in 2020, but at that assembly in the midst of COVID, all non-essential reports were bumped to 2022, including ours. Um, and and the, the 2020 General Assembly said, okay, we've learned a lot about technology. So if you have a report um, that is gonna be a revision to any part of the Book of Order and ought to have consideration of technology, do it. Be sure that's in there. So we were grateful to have the time to do that. Major changes. As I mentioned, we changed the name of this section of the Book of Order to church discipline because church discipline is so much more than rules. We simplified wording and organized sections into process that flows smoothly and clearly. I don't know if you've spent much time with the current rules of discipline, but to follow a process, you kind of have to flip back and forth because um, it sort of says, this is what you do at this point, and if it's remedial, you do it this way, and if it's disciplinary, you do it this way. We said, that's really confusing, and we're supposed to make it more accessible. So we did remedial process all the way through and disciplinary process all the way through so that if you file a complaint against your presbytery or your session, you can know what's going to happen start to finish. If you file an allegation against somebody, you, you can see each of the steps in the process from your filing on. And we incorporated wording from authoritative interpretations of the Book of Order that are often cited by judicial commissions in their ruling, but seem nobody seemed to know how we got there, except that the judicial commissions would refer to the annotated Book of Order and have that information. We thought, you know, anybody who's involved in the process ought to know um, about the case law that's behind an issue like this. So we tried to put it in. There are changes for permanent judicial commissions. The, the structure is there's a preamble as there is now. And then, and then there are two chapters on judicial commissions, how we elect them, how they function. Um, and so the major changes there are that former members of a PJC can be among those appointed to review process and to evaluate for administrative leave. The current book does not specify a quorum. We said it has to be at least five. It, it has to be five people to render a decision. Um, permanent judicial commissions are divided into three classes of membership as nearly equal as possible in size and vacancies are filled by election to specific classes. So that if I have to resign, 
for illness or because I move from a PJC I'm on, somebody is elected to finish my term. It's not, it's, there's nothing to specify that now. And we thought it, that, that that was important because it frankly got to be a mess in some presbyteries. People are eligible after two years instead of four years to be re-elected to a permanent judicial commission. Membership on permanent judicial commissions is to reflect the diversity of the membership of the council that elects them. When we were working, the last time we were face-to-face, -face, we did most of our work on Zoom, but the last time we were face-to-face, -face, uh, we got a letter from the General Assembly Committee charged to um, oversee the rights of racial ethnic minority people. And they said to us, racial ethnic minority people do not file a case because cases are usually tried by people who don't look like them or speak like them, or understand their perspective. And the, and the task force said to me, it is too late in our process to address this. Please go home and write a letter encouraging them. That's a, it's an important point. Please go home and write a letter to this guy, encouraging them to file an amendment. So I came home to write the letter and realized I couldn't write that letter because it would be easy. This would be an easy fix for us we use the language for nominating committees to say the same thing applies to permanent judicial commissions, that they have to reflect the diversity of the membership of the council that elects them. General process changes in both remedial and disciplinary cases are, there are procedures for electronic meetings, for testimony and for filing, and those are defined. Um, a first complaint or allegation has to be in writing to the clerk. But after that, if everybody agrees, things can be done electronically. Witnesses can appear electronically if they're not able to be physically present when there is a trial. And that replaces de 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 sorry, depositions, which means that people can be questioned by both sides in the trial. And the, and the provision for trials using electronic media is that everybody has to be able to hear and see everybody else. Um, Laura and I were talking earlier about the importance of cameras and microphones, and they are important because it makes it possible for us to do things electronically that we never could before. People who are expert witnesses and not witnesses of fact may not be required to appear at trials, regardless of whether they're Presbyterian or not. Um, as it is now, if an expert witness is a Presbyterian expert witness, we can, we can require them um, to be present. And we said, that's really not fair. We removed the second citation to witnesses because you can verify that somebody gets uh, their first citation. And if you don't have that verification, you don't need to send them another one. You know that you um, you have given their address wrong, gotten their address wrong. There's provision in church discipline for response to an appeal. And we did that in order to minimize filings of counter appeals. Um, again, trying to make the process both accessible and uh, fair um, to everybody involved, so that there's not those who are those who are um, session members or presbytery PJC members don't have to deal with appeal after appeal fighting each other in that way. And a request to withdraw an appeal is ordinarily automatically granted. Changes in the remedial process: the big ones are. The preliminary question regarding stating a claim on which relief can be granted has been expanded. There's an additional preliminary question, which is, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but essentially it is, is there in this complaint um, evidence of facts which are proved true mean that this council has erred or been delinquent? Declaratory relief is optional, but not mandatory. Um, 
and decisions may, with certain restrictions, be completed and published within 10 days of a hearing or trial, and they may and they may be published at an electronic meeting. Changes in the, there are more changes in the disciplinary process than there are in the remedial because more changes were asked for in the overture that got us to work. One of them is that um, there can be a request for reference for an investigation as well as for a trial. You do that because in small churches where everybody is kin to everybody else or the power dynamics are such that for a session to do the investigation would be hugely awkward. The session can ask the presbytery to do the investigation as well as do the trial. We introduced the language and the notion of restorative justice into the alternative resolution process with additional options for acts of voluntary repentance and for mediation. We don't do we don't do the kind of, in the church, we don't do the kind of, when we find somebody guilty, they have to give a lot of money, as we saw this week in the E. Car e. Jean Carroll case. Um, we don't do that. But we can't, but we do provide options for people who either admit guilt or have been found guilty to, um, to perform acts of voluntary repentance. As it is in the current rules of discipline, a mediator has to be certified. And we recognized, and, and we heard from people across the church when we sent this out, when we sent the revision out for study, that there are lots of places where there are no certified mediators available. So mediators have to be Presbyterian, but they, or, or they don't have to be Presbyterian, but they have to be familiar with the disciplinary process of the church so that they know what they're doing, uh, but they don't have to be certified. We put in, this is a thing that one I, I mentioned earlier that we brought into the constitution, some things that are now in the um, uh, an, annotated book of order. And one of them is every charge must state the specific provisions of scripture and of the constitution, which is alleged to have been violated. The standard for finding guilt spells out the definition of beyond a reasonable doubt. The current constitution's rules of discipline says that, uh, that guilt must be beyond a reasonable doubt. And as, as we heard from people across the church, a number of people said, so what's a reasonable doubt? Well, a reasonable doubt is when a comparison and consideration of all the evidence compels an abiding conviction that the material facts necessary to prove the charge are true. There is no, as you all, I hope know, there is no statute of limitation for filing an allegation of sexual misconduct. However, there is a limit of five years on any other kind of allegation. And as it is now, that limit is five years after an offense is alleged to have occurred. We, the task force thought we ought to lift all limits, but there were many in the church who said that just will, that just will create chaos. It's so, so unprovable after a long period of time. And so the language is that the, five-year limit is from the time that an alleged offense was discovered. In disciplinary matters, there are four levels of censure. One is rebuke. The second is rebuke with supervised rehabilitation. The third is temporary exclusion from office or membership with supervised rehabilitation. And the final, most, ser most serious is um, permanent exclusion from membership or office. You can ask to be restored and the body that um, has excluded you can 
can give you restoration, even if you have been permanently excluded at their discretion. But church discipline says that if at the if the terms of if the terms for restoration have not been met at the end of the period of temporary exclusion and after two extensions, then the um, exclusion may become permanent. And finally, each censure in a disciplinary case when people are found guilty in a trial is imposed with the statement, this censure is given not with malice or vindictiveness, but in Christian love to offer you correction in error and the possibility of full community restoration, except in the case of removal from ordered ministry or membership after the word error, correction in error, the language is and to restore the unity of the church by removing from it the discord and division the offenses have caused. That's different language than is in the current rules of discipline. We felt it was important to put it in there. It may be that the person being censured cannot hear the words at the time that they are spoken, but the body doing the censuring needs to be reminded that censure is not with malice or vindictiveness, but in Christian love. In the same way, the process for either remedial, remedial or disciplinary action begins with a reading of the preamble to church discipline, because as we're going about the process, we need to be reminded every time of what we're doing, because it is about accountability to God and to the community of which we all are a part. So that's basically a thumbnail sketch of what's there. I wonder if people have questions or comments. I was wondering, you know, provided this goes through and, and once it is approved, do you know what, what will happen if there is an PJC already at work or an investigating committee that is operating under the old form and then the new form, which one has jurisdiction and how that process goes? That's a great question. And yes, in the, um, in the recommendations, the date of adoption of this is the date for beginning new complaints for remedial action or um, allegations for disciplinary action. But something that's ongoing now goes under the rules that are that are in place now. And and it will be the it will be this summer at the anniversary of the end of last summer's general assembly when it's when it's adopted i have a question yes liz um whoops i'm so sorry I, I don't have a good way to pop my phone up um did i understand you to say that it, it is not fair to require expert witnesses to appear did i understand that correctly yes witnesses of fact who are Presbyterian can be compelled to appear. Right. But, but expert witnesses, we're not gonna pay them for time off. And we're not, I mean, we want them to appear, but but we but we decided as it is now, if you if you ask an expert witness who's not a Presbyterian to appear, that person can say, No, I can't come that day. But a Presbyterian can be cited and disciplined for not appearing. Oh yeah. Yeah, Got that's, it. thank you. There, are two, there were two standards for expert witnesses. Got it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Of course. Please, John. I to, I'm on my iPhone. I was trying to figure out how to do Zoom on my iPhone. Uh, and I noticed I was, my app is out of date. I'm John Thomason, East Tennessee. Uh, I had the interesting experience of serving as a clerk of session witness to a very long, 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 drawn out contentious trial that I'm, the Presbytery conducted. I'm so sorry. It was months and months and months for the appeals and mm -hmm. it all ended 
for all the pain it was and all the time, it all ended uh, in a positive way. So the process was good, but it took way too long. And I believe this new, the new rules of discipline uh, do as much as they possibly can to speed the process up. Of course, back then, this was a long time ago, we didn't have Zoom. Uh, right. I'm not going to a cell phone then. But, but the process appears to me it will be a lot faster, which, in my opinion, makes it a lot fairer because uh, the minister that was part of this is an active, productive minister uh, in the denomination today. It all worked through. It just took way too long. And I appreciate the work that you all did on it to shorten it up. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, we hope, too, that process will be shorter. Um, the, this, the, the fourth part of the Book of Order is the least well-known. And that can be problematic in in the trying of cases itself because people have to learn what they're doing. And then and then back in the day when everything had to be uh, certified mail, yeah, it took a long time. It took a long time. I have a question. Yes. Uh, Ronald Young, uh, New Hope, Chattanooga. Uh, wow. How many trials have we had in the Presbytery in the last, say, five years? Or how many charges have been made? Is this a common thing or a rare thing? Uh, Are we you asking not... about in East Tennessee? Yes. I don't know. We, we have not had a trial in a number of years. Uh, I'm trying to think back how long ago that was, and it was probably closer to 10 years ago that we had our last trial. Okay, thank you. And but I would say that is not to say that we have not used the book of discipline in the last number of years, because often what happens is the preliminary provisions about having an investigation and doing a negotiated settlement or just trying to look into a matter that is concerning um, you know, just like in the regular courts, things happen that you need a court system for, even though you don't go to a full blown trial. So I think if you're, it's true, if you're asking, was the, how many cases have we had that have gone to the permanent judicial system, um, but, or to, to a trial is way less than those that have used the system successfully. Um, we, anyway, we, have had, I'm, we have had a, a number of accusations that have entered into the process, but there was only one in my memory that has proceeded to trial. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask where the votes are at this point. Um, in I, terms I don't of want to passing this. I don't want to no, you I mean, all I, or we, say that what you've done is not important, but this will be the disciplinary process after June of this year. Oh, that's great. OK, yeah. good. No, we're glad to vote for or against the winning thing. Sharon, you're muted, and I and I want to hear what you what you have to say. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Sharon Cook from uh, East Tennessee. Does this mainly apply to pastors and staff, or can this apply to members of the church too? It applies to everybody. What happens now uh, oftentimes is people don't know about it. And so they get mad at somebody and they get bitter about it and they won't have anything to do with them. And it turns them off to the church. Okay. And, they, and in the preamble, um, when you read it, you'll see it says, if you have, you have something against your brother or sister, go talk to them about it. Take an elder if you need to but resolve it because this is for the welfare of the community, to hold one another accountable in the community. My hope would be that we use it all the time, Ron, but we use it all the time at that level, rather than gossiping about one another, complaining about one another, being ugly to one another, that we deal with things um, in that way. And yeah, it's for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
it seems like we might need to, at least some of our congregations might need to um, talk amongst ourselves more about this process and and make members of our congregation feel um, that they should engage in this rather than, you know, quiet backbiting or bitterness. Um, or leaving. I, beg pardon? Or leaving. Or leaving. Or leaving. Yes, I, I'm not familiar with too many people who have left, uh, although, you know, when people do disappear, we don't we don't always know why they left. Right. And um, this this could this could be a good occasion to to raise this issue among the congregation, educate us all. Yeah, I mean, a sermon, a sermon on uh, if your brother has something against you. When you, and you know it, when you bring your gift to the altar, go leave your gift and be reconciled to your brother. Would be a great text in which to begin a conversation about how, why we have the rule, why we have the disciplinary process and how it is, how it is useful to the health of our communities. I myself am not, not big on confrontation. And um, and I am very passive aggressive, <laughs> and I, I haven't had at my church. I have not had occasion to, um, you know, to to fall into that level of acrimony or disagreement with someone. But uh, it certainly, you know, it certainly can happen, and I'm sure it happened among other, you know, members. So this is good. Thank you. Absolutely. I think when we, I think when we see in the the. Uh... I was going to say newspapers, but people don't see those very often anymore. But in the, right. the news feeds and reports of um, activities that have happened in other denominations, it makes me very glad that the Presbyterian Church has the open and transparent system that it does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's straightforward, and it provides for checks and balances and a lot of transparency and yet confidentiality along the way. I Absolutely. Think. Absolutely. It passed the same week the Diocese of Baltimore um, made the news with uh, priest, priestly misconduct. And I said here, I am so glad that we have the process that we have and can say to our folks, you have a way to address things. We're not supposed, you know, we're not supposed to sweep them under the rug. We're supposed to deal with people, um, and we and it's and we spell out how we do that. But the timing, it just was ironically wonderful. Well, I'm not see, I'm not seeing much in the way of uh, interest in further conversation, Laura. I think you you gave us such a great overview to start, and um, thank you for everybody being here, Paige. Especially thank you for for all of your work over these years leading up to this, and for sharing tonight, so that um, we can hopefully get the word out. You all, if you have other commissioners, we will be James. I'll get the recording to you, and we can share that. Um, that with folks who may not have had a chance to be here so they can see the presentation. And so, um, yes, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Paige, so much. And um, many of you, I hope you are you are the commissioners for next week's Presbyterian meeting. So we'll see you on Tuesday. Great to meet you all. Thank you for the invitation. All right. Thank you so much. Blessings and peace to you all. Have a good night. Good night.